And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, folks. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Well, we've got a great, I mean, this is a power-packed program today. So many people have written to me, and they say, Tex, do you have one book, one book that you could tell us about, or we could buy from you, that will tell us what we need to know about Israel? You know, there, there's so many lies being spread about Israel, and many of them by Israel itself. And and folks, uh, they, they want to know what the word dispensationalism means. What does that mean, to be a dispensationalist? They want to know what Israel has to do with world history, with current events. And many people instinctively, I say instinctively, I believe it's from God, know that they're being lied to about Israel. But they, they can't make out the Bible. You know, the Bible, they say, is divided, at least we think it is, into the Old and New Testaments. And, and they, they believe that the Old Testament is different than the New Testament. And they can't really discern, you know, the differences, the distinctiveness. And they they want to find out what does the word Israel mean? Does it mean the people of God? Does it mean a particular race or DNA? Does it mean a nation? Does it mean those people who are of the religion of Judaism? Is that what what does it mean to be an Israel person or an Israeli? So. I have asked a gentleman to come on who's written a new book, and it is a terrific book. It's the best book that we have now. You know, I've written a couple of books myself about Israel, but none of them really ask the question, who is Israel? You know, that's the one question. And the answer is so very important. And, you know, if you don't have the answer to that, you may go off really in the wrong direction. And somebody may, when they first talk to you about Jesus Christ, about salvation, they may have been so obsessed with the nation of Israel that they, they brought you into Christianity the wrong way. Well, there's only one way into the, the truth of, of Jesus Christ. You know, he said, you know, narrow is the way. And few there are that, that find that narrow way. So somebody will try to take you into the broad path right from the very beginning. And you're really not even a Christian, and you don't even know it. You're you're some kind of a, well, half Jew, half Christian. You know, you're just mixed up. Well, this book will tell you everything. Well, not everything. can't be everything. be many volumes. But I'll tell you, this book will lead you to the right path. It will It will tell you who to go to where to go to, and that's that's the beauty of, of this book. It's by a pastor from Mountain View. He's pastor of the Mountain View Baptist Church in Custer, South Dakota. I'm going to have to ask him about that name. That, I don't like that. Custer, South Dakota. <laughs> well, does that have anything to do with General Custer? Well, in any case, it's Mountain View Baptist Church in Custer, South Dakota. Matt First is his name, F-U-R-S-E. Matt first, he's the pastor there. So he's got this book. Let's see, it's about, uh, oh, 300 and, oh, I'm just going to say 350 pages, a couple pages less, 350 pages, just came out. And he was so kind to send me a copy of, of this book. And like so many books, I, you know, I, I say, yes, I'll read it. And, and, and I do, I read people's books when I tell them that I, I really didn't think it'd be worth much because, you know, I mean, it would be something that somebody would try to, Put out, and so many people try to do books, and they just don't quite make it. But boy, this book really just engrossed me. And so, you know, the first night I got it home and read it all, and uh, you know, <laughs> woke up the next morning, you know, <laughs> still uh, groggy from having read the whole book. Just a great book, Pastor Matt. First, welcome to Power of Prophecy. Thank you. You know, th- this book is so important. Maybe I should just start off right away just saying, why did you, uh, of all the subjects that you could write about as a pastor and a Baptist pastor, that, why did you write this book? That's a good question. Um, 
I was interested in eschatology through my pastor. I found out about the time I was done with Bible college that he had a different view about eschatology, about the pre-tribulation rapture and things like that. And I really respected him, and uh, he wrote a thesis. I read it. I chewed on it and chewed on it. And uh, for the last 15 years, I've been studying the subject of eschatology, and I began to realize that the biggest elephant in the room was this, the biggest argument that dispensationalists and pre-trib people have is that uh, Israel, there's got to be time for Israel to become Israel again and to be saved after the rapture was their theory. And so I, be- I began to test their theory and study what they said and realized that who they said Israel was was not Israel and began to realize uh, what the Bible was saying versus what a lot of theology books are saying, and realized then that there wasn't anybody out there teaching it or talking about it. And so I decided that God was putting it upon my heart to write this book, even if no one else believed it or listened to it, at least my own sons would read it and be able to understand that I wasn't a complete kook and here's what I really believe. Well, yeah, eschatology, maybe we should define that word, because, uh, you know, it's sort of a Times, the study of the word. end time. <laughs> coming of Christ. Okay, study of the end time, the coming of Christ. Bible prophecy, in other words. Yeah. And, 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 well, the book of Revelation says that Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So I guess you might say he's a spirit of yes. eschatology as well. Now, you mentioned right. dispensationalism. And, you know, you know I'm, I'm, a King James, I'm a King James believer, and I use only the King James Bible. And, you know, the Bible itself says that we have a more sure word of prophecy. And part of the problem is, is that most Christians, quote-unquote, have gotten away from the Word of God, and they are believing what they think is the Word of God, but it's actually just man's commentary or man's opinion on it. You know, most people who write to me, and and I I want us to try to define dispensationalist in just a minute, but who are, most people who write to me are dispensationalists. And, you know, I've heard many sermons on this before in Baptist churches and such, and a few other independent churches, but they always take one verse or a couple of verses, and they build up a whole case on that. And so when I began you know, studying the Word of God for myself, I, I realized there was so much more to the Bible than they were giving me. They would give me one little verse. And, of course, I was so hungry for the Word of God, and I was searching it, that you know I would find 15 or 20 verses throughout the Bible that were wonderful about this same subject. Then I suddenly realized that that one verse they were talking about was not the whole counsel of God. Have you have you sort of had the same experience, uh, Matt? Yes, and I found a great little pamphlet uh, written by a man named William E. Cox on why I left Schofieldism. And C.I. Schofield pretty much introduced dispensationalism to America uh, over 100 years ago. And I certainly don't claim to know everything about dispensationalism. And years ago I had a, a Bible college professor, a friend of mine, ask me, if I was dispensational or covenant theologian. And, you know, what I told him back then was, I don't know, I just believe the Bible. And <laughs> there you go. <laughs> after studying it for years, that's still my answer. I believe the Bible. I don't have to be in anybody's camp. Just because I might disagree with either side here or there doesn't mean I've joined the other side. No, I just, I'm just a biblicist. I just believe the Word of God. And my study, I, I delved into Schofield himself, and what I found there was shocking about himself and one of, one of the textbooks that I would recommend is a, a man who, he, he just passed away a couple of years ago. His name is David Lutzweiler, and he used to be a dispensationalist, and he wrote a book called um, The Praise of Folly, The Enigmatic Life and Theology of C.I. Schofield. And it's a great book on the subject of, of C.I. Schofield himself. And between Cox and Lutzweiler, I learned a lot about what they claim is Bible, but actually is a stretch or complete falsification of what the Word of God is actually saying. And these guys were both dispensationalists themselves, and they came out of it because they recognized the Word of God to be their final authority. Well, you know, I've noticed that, oh, let's just say Lutheran, uh, Methodist, Presbyterian, those kind of churches, you know, mainline denomination churches, they're sort of liberal today, uh, so (laughs) most people just don't pay any attention to them. Right. They just go there and, you know, they... They sit in the pews, and they don't really understand the message. They they know of Jesus and of the cross, and that's really about all they know. So this dispensational message... Uh, And and you know, I would would say those mainline churches that you're talking about, 
in my mind, that's kind of what Paul was warning about in Romans 11, about the Gentile branches, you know, and, and how that uh, we, we have the right information, the right knowledge, but we can easily become dead ourselves. That's true. Um, They're really lukewarm, uh, aren't they? It's more than just information in our head. It must be faith in, in our heart. And God is no respecter of person. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The salvation way is, is the same for all. That's right. And, and those people in those churches, they really don't know anything about dispensationalism or eschatology. or They just sort of float, you might say. Right. But now Baptist right. uh, and, and similar people. Right. Are really into the evangelicals seem to be really into this Israel thing. Yes, and and that's where you you, yes. you, you butt heads with these folks today. Yes, they are so positive. Just take yes. a few verses of the Bible, and they built this whole theology of dispensationalism on, and they really are sincere. I mean, they really believe in it, don't they? Yes, and it is interesting. A lot of Baptists, and I'm an independent Baptist, and I certainly appreciate most everything that independent Baptists would stand for. But I'm amazed uh, how even the conservative evangelicals are swallowed up by this. A lot of it has to do with the fact that Dallas Theological Seminary was basically a Schofield school. His disciple, Lewis Berry Schaefer, started the school. You have all of your popular radio preachers pretty much are from there, from J. Vernon McGee all the way up. And the funny thing is, is Schofield himself was never a Baptist. Lewis Berry Schaefer was never a Baptist. But men like McGee or the, even David Jeremiah and, and everything in between, you have these guys that would be considered Baptist or evangelical, and yet they all have been trained and taught to think along the dispensational lines through the Schofield notes, Schofield teaching the dispensations that uh, have been brainwashed and taught throughout the last hundred years. Well, you know, many of them have written to me some big names over the years, and they, they've, they've told me how I've gone off the rails. You know, you, you've really gone off the rails sure. in this. And they always, it ends up, the conversation is, and I have very pleasant conversations with them, but they they always end up saying, you don't understand the difference between Israel and the church. You're confusing the two. That's right. And I, I see in your book right. that you talk about that, that really you've got to understand the difference between the church and Israel. Well, you know, I've always felt like the, the church is where I want to be. I mean, the church is, that's, that's yes. the church of Jesus Christ. Yes. And that's what I want a person so, to understand. We have a, mm-hmm. yeah, we, we have a, we have an oxymoron, uh, in, in our circles today. It's called Judeo Christian. Mm. You know, that, that term's not in the Bible. Uh, can you imagine the Apostle Paul, who was stoned by Jews, or John, boiled in, in, in oil, as the tradition says, and these Jewish apostles, these disciples of Jesus who got saved, and Paul later talks about how I used to persecute people in the Jews' religion. And if you were to, you know, approach Paul and say, "Hey, so what do you what do you think about the Judeo-Christian politician we have running right now?" and he'd look at you and say, "Judeo-Christian? What? There is no such thing as Judeo-Christian. When you're a Christian, you're not you're not a Jew. You're not a Judaizer. You're a Christian." He dealt with that in the book of Galatians, and a lot of these dispensationalists try to just steer clear of Galatians. But Paul clearly says, they that are in Christ, the same are the children of Abraham. And so, uh, in Romans, it says in chapter 2, you're not a Jew, which is one outwardly, but one inwardly, the circumcision of the heart and not of the outward. He said in Philippians, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit. And, and so, it's clear that the Bible is teaching that the true Israel is the spiritual. And Spurgeon even alluded to it in his book, According to Promise, God's methods with dealing with his chosen people, he alluded to the fact that the spiritual Israel was the true and that the spiritual is the real. You know, we think the real is the flesh, but the real is actually the spiritual. The spiritual lasts longer than the flesh. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In Romans chapter 9, Paul said, They are not all Israel which are of Israel. Well, how how do you define that? How do you explain that verse? They are not all Israel which are of Israel unless he's saying they are not all spiritual Israel, which are a physical Israel. And that is the problem. The the Jewish people 2,000 years ago were very proud of their physical lineage through Abraham. In John chapter 8, they argued with Jesus and said, we're of our father Abraham. And he said, well, yes, physically you are of your father Abraham, but spiritually you're of your father the devil. And uh, that didn't sit well with him. 
<laughs> and uh, by the time the conversation ended, they wanted to kill him and stone him with stones. But he told them, before Abraham was, I am. A- your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. And Galatians 3 says, They that are in Christ, the same are the children of Abraham. It is by faith. Abraham's circumcision came a couple decades after his faith. The Bible teaches us that. And uh, it is not outward physical anything. It is just spiritual. And that's why Jesus said to a Jewish man named Nicodemus, Ye must be born again. Apparently, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee, did not have an inroad to heaven by being a Jew. He must be born again. And Jesus said, ye, meaning plural, all of you must be born again. And by God's grace, the Pharisee Paul, Saul, was saved and became the Apostle Paul. And God used him to tie together the Old Testament scriptures with the the concept of this is a spiritual family of God. It always has been. And uh, we are not to pay attention to endless genealogies, which is another question I bring up to any of the guys that want to argue about a future for a physical Israel, how can that be when the when the New Testament clearly tells us more than one place not to pay attention to endless genealogies? If that's the case, then how can anyone prove they own the land? A year ago I was in Israel on a tour and met an older gentleman up there on the northern border right next to Syria. And he, uh, he actually was from Cleveland, Ohio. He changed his name and... I said, I said, so have you traced your, your lineage back to the 12 tribes? Which tribe are you from? And he, he looked down and said, you know, I've tried, but I can't. And then he pointed at me and he said, for all we know, you could be a descendant of Abraham too. And so then I went out to the bus and I asked the tour guide, I said, uh, asked him the same thing. Have you traced your lineage back to the tribes? Do you know which tribe you're from? And our Israeli Jewish tour guide said, you know, nobody can. If, you know, we don't, we don't really know for sure who is a descendant of Abraham. And I thought to myself, then why is it your land? What makes it your land? Because you called yourself a Jew? Because your grandparents did? This is the biggest crock, this is the biggest fraud on the world. We are literally fighting over and supporting to the tune of $11 million a day as Americans, one group of people in the Middle East to the agitation and dismay of a lot of other people in the Middle East. And it is no wonder that they hate Christianity, because Christianity is taking physical sides. And we are now being used as Americans to support and fight for one side versus the other. No wonder they hate us. No wonder we're not popular. No wonder they're angry. And this is all very sad, because Satan is winning. Neither the Jew or the wants to hear about Jesus Christ. Because Christians, quote-unquote, are saying that the Bible says a certain group of people, ethnic people, deserve to own this land. And it's not even based on Scripture. It's false doctrine. You know, you, you make a great point in the spiritual Israel versus the um, physical or the carnal Israel. This, again, has been, you know, <laughs> argued with me uh, of Baptist pastors. They will tell me, well, Tex, you're talking about spiritual Israel. You can't do that. I mean, the most important thing is physical or carnal Israel. And I said, would you, Pastor, would you say that again, please? Read it, say it real slow and understand what you're saying. And he'll say it again. He still doesn't get it. And and I say, well, well, everything in the Bible, it all comes down to the spirit. I mean, we're all, you know, Pastor, we're we're going to, flesh is going to go back to the, to the, to dust. You know, dust to dust. We're gonna we're gonna leave this this planet some you know at, at some point in time, and we're gonna be spirit. You know, I'm not gonna argue with people right now about what form of spirit. That I know we'll be like God, but we won't be God. You know, but sure. it's it's interesting that these sure. people they are so fastened, they're so intent on declaring the greatness of Israel as a carnal physical nation that they don't even know what they're saying. And I say, well, just a minute. Isn't spiritual important to you? Well, it is, but you know, and then they go in to tell me how great the physical uh, right. parameters of, of Israel are. are. And, and it, isn't, that, isn't that just odd? It's, it's like, how can Christians even... I mean, you would think if a person is truly a, a Christian, they must understand that everything is, is spiritual. Every, everything. They're a new person sure. in Christ. 
I, I mean, they're born again in Christ. They're, they, they have a spiritual, you know, inner, <laughs> inner, and, but it's, it's amazing. They're even circumcised spiritually, but yet they go back, they sure, keep, absolutely. They, they, they really want to hold on to this planet. They want to hold on to a piece of land. They, they've got to keep up that carnal world, don't they? Right. That, that's just our human nature is to focus on the carnal. And the Bible tells us that we walk by faith, not by sight. And God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus said the spirit quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Mm. Uh, the Bible says that flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And the Bible tells us that, that this whole world is going to melt someday, probably very soon. <laughs> that's and right. And why are we wasting time arguing over real estate that's going to melt? The Bible tells us there's a new Jerusalem. You know, Galatians chapter 4, Paul said the allegory between Isaac and Ishmael was illustrating the mother above, the Jerusalem that is above, the mother of us all, spiritually speaking, born again, born from above, not physical birth, not the old Jerusalem, but the new Jerusalem. And so, you know, I have no desire to even claim the real estate over there. I believe God owns it, not either side. But he's going to down one of these days real soon, and he's going to set up a new heaven and a new earth. There'll be, the, the, there'll be a new Jerusalem, the Bible says, and we need to recognize what a waste of time and what silliness that Satan has gotten us into here with all of this. Oh, he really, he really has. It's just, it's an amazing thing. You know, I, recently there was a, a, a gal, I forget her name, but she was uh, of Wheaton University. And, and I, I guess she, <laughs> she was a, uh, oh, I think she taught uh, political science. Wheaton University in Illinois is a, supposedly a Christian school. Her name is Hawkins, right. I remember now, Professor Hawkins. But she was wearing a hijab, you know, a, a you know scarf like the uh, the Muslims do, and she said that she wanted to uh, show sol solidarity with the Muslims because, according to her, she had read the Pope's writings, and what the Pope said was that the Muslims were also saved, and and this uh, gal she claimed to be a Christian, was uh, going to an Episcopal church a professor at Wheaton, a, a Christian university, she says th the Muslims are also the people of the book. Now, think of, think about that. And of course, the Jews are supposedly the the people of the book. And they, they, they call themselves the people of the book. What, what do you think about it? Is that true? Yeah, well, no. I mean, <laughs> I was going to say, you know, Slomo Sand wrote a book called The Invention of the Jewish People, and he, he points out that both the Jews and the Palestinians have the same heritage, the same physical lineage, and uh, he's probably right. You know, people talk about anti-Semitic, but you know, the truth is everybody over there is Semitic. I mean, Abraham had many wives and many sons after Isaac and Ishmael, and you know, the idea of, of arguing the flesh is just such a waste of time. The Bible tells us not to pay attention to endless genealogies, and the people of the book, according to the Word of God, are the people who are born again. They're the only ones that will last. They're the only ones that will be saved. Everyone else will be lost. To to claim any kind of right because of your physical birth is is totally against what Jesus said to a very religious ruler of the Jews named Nicodemus. You must be born again. And we all must be born again. That's the bottom line. And, you know, going back to the carnal thinking and the carnal viewing of things with our fleshly eyes, when Schofield came you know, introduced his, his Bible with, reference Bible with notes, it was only a couple decades afterwards that that uh, the nation of Israel was reborn, the nation, the Jewish state. And I think that's really what caused a lot of sincere but misled Christians and pastors to believe that Schofield was prophetic and that what he wrote was prophetic because of the physical illustration that was not true to the Word of God, but simply a physical decoy they fell for. And uh, it is obvious that the people who went back to Israel in 1947 were not born-again Christians, and the vast majority of them over there are not now. And uh, we, we've, we've, we've followed the lie as evangelicals, and, um, and, and so there's been a lot of, of repositioning of theology in the last 70 years as a result of it. You know, you hear all the time, 
we, we must bless Israel. You know, we, you know, I'll bless them that bless thee, curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We must bless Israel if we want to be blessed. Well, let me ask any American, what were the greatest days of our country, the last 70 or the previous before 1940s? I mean, in the 1940s, it wasn't until the late 1940s that we that we had the separation of church and state ridiculousness that came in the Supreme Court. We didn't have abortion back in the 1940s, and we certainly didn't have the debt we have today. It's a, it's insane. We 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 now, as America, we give Israel 11 million dollars every day. There's no other country in the world in our history that we've ever given so much money to, and yet I don't think that I've gotten my $11 million worth of things today, I think our nation is falling apart. And, and, and besides all of that, the Word of God was talking to Abraham. I will bless them that bless thee. Thee is a singular word. It is not all of your descendants, Abraham. But I noticed that Schofield changed it to descendants. If you look at the notes underneath Genesis chapter 12, Schofield said, that this blessing was for Abraham and his descendants. But that's not what the King James Bible says. It just simply says, thee. And, and Paul emphasized that when you get to Galatians chapter 3. Paul said, not seeds, plural, but seed, singular. And that singular seed was Jesus Christ. And so the nation that blesses the seed of Abraham, singular, which is Jesus Christ, that nation will be blessed. Well, you look back at America's founding... We used to bless Jesus Christ. We used to honor him. Today, America does not honor Jesus Christ. Today's America honors the Jew, but, but does not honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are not seeing the blessing of God. We are seeing the curse, and it's all around us. We're not blessing Jesus Christ, who was the seed of Abraham. We've changed from blessing the seed singular to focusing on seeds plural, and nobody has figured that out yet, or at least not the majority. And until we do, we'll never see this nation turn, turn around. That's true. I mean, I mean think about it. Uh, when people say, you know, God won't bless us unless we bless Israel. Well, we have really blessed them, like you say, 11 million a day. We, I mean, without us, they would have been just, just totally exterminated over there uh, by, the, by the Arabs or enemies. Absolutely. But uh, we have really blessed them. I mean, no other nation on earth has blessed them like we have. And what has it got us? We're a nation where our own president says we're not even a Christian nation. We're bringing in, you know, mil millions of Muslims right. now. Uh, I mean, where, where, where is the blessing? I mean, look at Hollywood, everything. We, it's, we're, we're degraded. We're immoral. We're vulgar. We're a horrible nation. And is that is that what they mean? I mean, uh, I, nobody can explain that where the blessing comes from. You you stated it very well. There, Again, the, we haven't been sure. blessed at all, have we? We, we? We've we've taken our eyes off of the seed singular of Abraham, which is Christ, and we focused it on quote unquote descendants of Abraham, who themselves can't even prove they're really a descendant of Abraham, <laughs> and we've somehow thought that we that we're doing the right thing, and that God's going to bless us as a result of that. And it's just not true. And not only are we not being blessed, but we are being cursed. And mm. today, uh, it is certainly uh, politically incorrect to say anything negative about Jewish people, because you're automatically called an anti-Semitic person if you do, and that's not me at all. I don't hate anybody or any people on, uh, of any ethnic background. But when you tell the truth about a situation, it turns in they turn it into hate speech. And so it's it's more it's it's more tolerable to to say negative things about Jesus Christ. If I if I started saying all kinds of negative things about Christ, nobody would scream and cry about that. Oh, you'd probably be celebrated for negative it. things about what a wonderful pastor. Right. I mean he's I you know, he's a he's a rebel. He's do, a great I'm in trouble. Sure. Well, we're, we're going to take a break now. Folks, my guest today is Pastor Matt Furse. That's F-U-R-S-E, pastor of the Mountain View Baptist Church. We're talking about who is Israel. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I'm Tex Walters. Who is Israel? 
yesterday, today, and forever by Matt Furse. Well, that's the book I'm holding in my hand here. You know, it's a very, very attractive book, very pretty. Who is Israel? You know, that's a very important question. And the fact is that a great number of Christians do not have the answer. They don't. I can ask them the question. They'll give me the wrong answer. Now, how do I know they've got the wrong answer? Because I have the Bible in front of me. I have the verses. And you have to know the Bible to, to understand who is Israel. Now, this doesn't necessarily, you know, affect your salvation. I mean, people can be saved without even knowing there is an Israel. Uh, you know, Jesus Christ is the one who saves us and belief in him and what he did on the cross. There, there, that's the most important thing. But once you start off in Christianity, you'll want to know who is Israel because there are going to be many people come to you with so many fictitious lies. And I mean, you're going to get very mixed up. Well, here's a book. Finally, you have a book that'll give you the answer. Now, this is very important for you. Because I guarantee you, it's going to affect your politics. It's going to affect your social life. And, hey, if you know who is Israel, you'll probably have, you'll, you'll have all kinds of difficulties. They may even, they may excommunicate you from the church because you've read the Bible and they haven't. And they think they know Israel. Uh, but they've got the wrong idea of it and that you are some kind of a kook. Well, that's what you get for studying the Bible, for reading the Bible. <laughs> But all of us who have the Bible understand that. And so I want you to have this book, Who is Israel? Now, we it's about 350 pages. It's a terrific book. In fact, it has more than just about Israel. It's, it's, it's everything from, oh, my goodness, I just turned a page here, Judaism and homosexuality. Wow. You'll learn all about what the Jews think about homosexuality. You'll also, oh, let's see here, there's, I mean, the, the Judaic lobby, the, the Israeli lobby, the, the, the term Judea, Judeo-Christian. There's, this is just a great book. You'll learn about false flag terrorism. There's all these side issues of today. Well, you'll learn what happened possibly to General George Patton. Isn't that a, that's a shocker here on page 125. So there's so much in this book, and I want you to have this book for $25. Please add $5 shipping and handling. As for the book, Who is Israel? It's, it's, a, it's a shocker because it's true. <laughs> and it, you know, it's, it's a, but it's a fabulous book. It takes you right to the verses, right to the history, to everything you need to know to become confident, to become learned, and really just to know the, the facts about who is Israel. Israel. I like the subtitle, Yesterday, Today, and Forever. That's, that's an important thing. They'll say, well, Israel was this yesterday, but today it's this. Really? And tomorrow it's going to be this. They have a different version. And you need to understand who is Israel forever and ever. Who was it originally? Everything is in this book. Matt First is the author. I want you to have it again. $25 plus $5 shipping and handling. We'll get it right off to you. We've got plenty of copies. I'm sure Matt will keep them coming to us if we need more. Who is Israel? You're going to love this book. I promise you, so many who have written me, you said, I need a book that tells me everything. Now, listen, if you've got friends and they dispute who Israel is, or they're dispensationalists, so-called, in a minute we're going to get to that definition of the word dispensationalism. If they believe in all this genealogy and all this kind of nonsense the Bible tells you don't even worry about, if they believe in all this stuff, if they believe you've got to bless Israel or God's not going to bless you or, and all these things, you need an extra copy of this book. You might want to buy a copy for your pastor and ask him to actually read it. Of course, it's going to change his doctrines. It's going to change what, what he knows to be true. Then he's going to have to tell the church if he's an honest man. And then he may get excommunicated. I don't, I don't know. I'll ask Matt first about that in just a moment, but he might be. There are people out there that, that are telling the truth and they can't believe that they're getting such opposition. That's the way the devil is. He's got this, these, these concepts out there 
And if you go against the concepts by reading the Bible for yourself and, 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 and telling people about the Bible, you're, you're crossways with the devil. I mean, you're already in trouble with the devil. But who cares about that? Who cares about being crossways with the devil? Of course you're going to be crossways with the devil. Celebrate yourself. <laughs> be happy with that. Blessed are you. Well, anyway, the book. Who is Israel? $25 plus $5 shipping and handling. Total of $30. Now, here's how to get it. Phone us toll free. 1-800-234-9673. The friendly receptionist will take your order. And we'll get this book. If you're not receiving our newsletter, Power of Prophecy, well, we're going to send you a free issue. Well, actually, six months. Yeah, when you order this book, we're going to send it six months. If you're already getting the newsletter, we're going to just resubscribe you. Give it to you another six months. That's what we do. That's what that's we'll be glad to do that. Now, you can get it online, of course, at powerofprophecy.com, powerofprophecy.com, or textmars.com. If you can spell my name right, a lot of people can't, but anyways, T-E-X-E-M-A-R-R-S.com. I don't think I can spell it right either if it wouldn't on my birth certificate, so I don't blame you. Textmars.com. Or powerofprophecy.com. You can write to us. Send us $30. It'll take care of shipping and handling. Say, text, send me that Who is Israel book. Or say, just send me that Israel book. I think we'll know who you're, what, what you're talking about. By Matt first, send me that Who is Israel book. We'll be glad to get it right out to you. Our address is Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N Road, Austin, Texas, Seven eight seven three three. Jerry, how long have we been here at this address? Twenty some odd years. Yeah, maybe someday you know we'll have a new building, or maybe Jesus is going to come first. I I think <laughs> I believe he's going to come first before we we were at this building. I believe he will. Well, anyway, we've been here over twenty twenty five years, something like that. Maybe thirty. I I don't know. Ah, oh, twenty six twenty six years. Let's just say it. Okay. Who is Israel? Now let's return to our regular program. My guest is Pastor Matt First of Mountain View Baptist Church. Hey, Pastor First, welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Now, Custer, South Dakota. Yeah. Now, who named it Custer? The Indians didn't do that, did they? No, uh, but Custer is the oldest town in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Uh -huh. And why it's named Custer is because when Custer came through on the expedition, his men discovered gold right here. Oh boy! And that gold discovery is what that gold discovery caused the gold rush into the Black Hills, which violated the treaty that the government had made with the Indians. Oh boy! And that's what started the war. And then eventually Custer died over in Montana, a little ways from here. And so it's kind of a ironic, poetic justice. It was his own gold discovery that brought about his demise because that gold discovery caused the greed of the white man to invade this area, which caused the Indians to retaliate from the broken treaty. Well, for the love of money is the root of all evil, isn't it? And that's for sure. <laughs> really? Well, now, what is that? Is that pretty close to where they have these big, uh, these super heads on the mountain top there? That's right. Mount Rushmore, Mount about Rushmore. 20 miles from where I'm sitting right now. Now, is it, is it true that they're going to put a big head of uh, Barack Obama up there, too, or is that just a, a rumor? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they'll get away with that. Oh, okay. All right. There, there's, there's, not a, there's not enough for room for two faces. <laughs> so, two, he'd need two faces, huh? Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Very good. Well, who is Israel? You know, people are asking, what is dispensationalism? Maybe, you know, don't go into it. I mean, uh, don't give us a big lecture. What, what is what? Why do, when people say, are you a dispensationist, what are they really asking? Well, you know, John MacArthur was asked that question. You can look it up on YouTube. And he said, basically, dispensationalism for me, he said, is that Israel has a future. And uh, that's really what it boils down to. Um, on In Matthew 12, Schofield, who was the pretty much the father of dispensationalism for Americans, through John Darby over in England, Schofield changes what Jesus said. Jesus said that they'll, they'll be the sheep and the goats. He'll divide the sheep from the goats. And Schofield just blatantly says in his notes, there's three classes of people, the sheep, the goats, and the brethren. 
Hmm. And the brethren, quote unquote, are the Jews. And uh, th- that's not what Jesus said at all. In fact, Jesus said a few chapters later that his brethren were those who did his will. But Schofield basically takes, and dispensationalism basically takes, the physical Jewish people and provides them a second chance after the rapture, uh, a secret rapture where the Christians, the Gentile Christians, are are raptured and and then the unsaved uh, Jews are going to miraculously all turn to the Lord. Thence, when the hundred forty four thousand will come about, and and on and on it goes, and that's that's just the pre trib theology, eschatology that has been taught on Christian stations today because of seminaries from the past, pastors everywhere that are otherwise good men who teach the Word of God and believe in the Gospel, are very misinformed on this subject, and dispensationalism teaches ages, and that there are different ages, and that the church age will come to an end, but the Bible clearly says that the that the church will be forever, world without end. Hmm. So, so really, dispensational means basically that the Jews are going to have another chance. It seems to me, and, and of course, uh, right? You, you know, wow. Uh, so the the cross didn't do a very good job, or they they would have gone ahead and taken their chance. I mean, it seems it seems to me, right. The cross was not very effective, but they're going to get another chance at it, right? Now, I'm just being well, smart like about it. Since but. you bring that up, you know, the book of he- the book of Hebrews. Guess who the book of Hebrews was written to? The people who spoke Hebrew, right? Mm. And and yet the book of Hebrews clearly says, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Not future, right now. The book of Hebrews also says that neither by the blood of bulls and goats, but by his own blood. And the book of Hebrews is clearly saying that the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was the final sacrifice. We are no longer offering animal sacrifices. But pre-trib theology teaches that there will be a temple and there will be an animal sacrificial system going on in that temple. And that flies in the face of the Word of God. And Jesus himself said that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So how can the book of Hebrews be correct if there is this supposed seven-year tribulation after the rapture? This is This is a a clear division line drawn in the sand between what God's Word says and what man's theology has been saying. Now, seven years, I've never seen that in the Bible, but they always tell me there's seven years. But I've never read that seven years. Is that sort of made up by the dispensationalists, that seven years? Yeah, well, they take take Daniel chapter 9 and try to say that there's a seven-year future. Uh, but you look at the old commentaries, that's not what they say. Even just a simple little commentary like Haley's Bible Handbook, you'll find out a different viewpoint of the seven years and the sacrifice of Christ when he caused the oblations to cease. I believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he caused the oblations to cease in the midst of the week. Jesus' ministry was about three and a half years, and so it fits perfectly. In the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And the Bible clearly says, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, but by his own blood. And I just told my folks in our church just recently, I don't care where it is, I don't care what who it is, but if anybody is doing animal sacrifices today, they are Satanists. They are not following the Word of God. And anybody in the future who starts animal sacrifices are not following the Word of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, because he cried out from the cross, it is finished. And the veil in the temple ripped in two from the top to the bottom, the old... Testament sacrificial system was done. And when the veil ripped in two, it was as if God was telling those priests, you need to go down to Job Corps and find a new job because this one's done. <laughs> well, you know, a, a day, a, a year where the uh, Jews, even now, the Orthodox Jews uh, sacrifice chickens. And, of course, you can go on YouTube New and York. see them. Yeah, New York, they sacrifice the chickens. And they, they make a big deal of you. Put all your sins on that chicken. Then you sacrifice that chicken, you don't have any more sins. Of course, this is the same as the voodoo of the Santeria and all that. Butter chickens right on the streets of New York City. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's just, a, of course, they're looking for what some yeah. a calf without a without a little piece of a white on him or <laughs> totally red. They've been looking for that calf, I guess, for yeah. hundreds of years, huh? To sacrifice him. Sure. So uh, just it's yeah, just big, amazing. Making a big deal about the 
the ashes of the red heifer, but it absolutely does not matter. Now, there's two things that, I, that I'd like to really discuss, particularly this time, uh, Pastor First. First of all is the Old Covenant, and the second is the Kingdom. But let's first talk about the Old Covenant. You mentioned the book of Hebrews. Now, the book of Hebrews discusses the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. And, of course, I get many letters from, from dispensationalist Christians who believe in this Israel nonsense who say the Old Covenant still exists. In fact, the Pope himself, of course, he's often wrong. So He's wrong so often. But uh, I use it as an example because there's a billion Christians who say they believe in the Pope. He says the Old Covenant is still in effect. And, well, John Hay, many, many thousands of people, mostly Baptists, believe the Old Covenant uh, is still in faith. And that's why the Jews can can be saved without Jesus, because they have their old covenant. And but, that's the, but what does the book of Hebrews really say about the old versus the new covenant? Right. Well, and, and it clearly says that the, uh, the old is done away uh, and put away like an old garment, and that the old was simply an illustration of the new. And uh, And yet what we have to remember is, the new was actually the original. The Bible says in Revelation that Jesus was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Mm. And so it's not it, it's not like God had plan B. It was plan A all along. He just instituted the Old Covenant, Mosaic Covenant, to keep it physically illustrated before our eyes physically until Christ would come. And John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I was asked a while back by a young lady in our church, how did they get saved in the Old Testament? And my answer was, by the Lamb, by the blood of the Lamb, that was illustrated through the physical animal sacrifices, but has always been Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus mentioned from the blood of righteous Abel, who offered a lamb, versus his brother Cain. And, and how that... The illustration was the animal sacrifices, but the real salvation was always Christ. Job, the oldest written scripture that we have, the book of Job, Job himself says, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he'll stand in the latter days upon the earth. Mm. Abraham, Jesus said in John 8, that Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. And Abraham prophetically said to his son Isaac on that hill of Moriah in Genesis 22, God will provide himself a lamb. And so it's not like God had plan B. It's always been plan A. But he illustrated the spiritual with the physical. And this is the problem with people is that the carnal thinking and and not seeing it spiritually, they, they tend to focus on the physical. They think that there needs to be a physical temple. But the New Testament tells us that each individual believer, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that we together as a church body are the temple of the Lord. Hmm. So the old covenant is gone. It's it's vanished. Uh, Jesus came, and there was, yes. the, there was the illustration. There was the great example we need to believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that was the new new covenant. Right. And it's it's almost insane to go back to the old covenant when the new covenant is all of life. I mean, it's it's uh, the truth, and and it, it's very clear there too that there's that, that Jesus was the one sacrifice. So why do they go? Why, why do these? How do these pastors? I don't understand how a pastor can say, "Well, Jesus wasn't good enough for the Jews. He's only good enough for the Gentiles." What what is what is that saying? I mean, what are they? To me, that is such a degradation of the truth. It's it's a horrible, immoral thing. Absolutely. Wow. The Old Covenant. Absolutely. Folks, if you believe in the Old Covenant, read Hebrews. It's it's gone. It's van it's it was vanishing. It was that was finished. And Jesus on the cross, that was right. that was sufficient for all of eternity. Well, now the kingdom. That's right. The kingdom. I want to make that because many people believe the kingdom is coming. You know, that they believe that the kingdom is not here. Now there again, they 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 get mixed up the physical versus the spiritual kingdom, don't they? Right. And the disciples, in the people of of the day, you know, I think uh, 
I think it was Acts chapter 1, Lord, will you now restore the kingdom? Mm. And they're thinking physically. Yes. When he, the triumphal entry, you know, he was popular, he was popular with Judas until Judas realized he's not going to restore a physical kingdom. He, he's, he's focused spiritually. And Judas was following Christ, in my opinion, only because of the physical, only what he, what, what he could get out of it physically. Uh, he saw Jesus as a political uh, answer to to what he wanted. And, uh, you know, Christ was emphasizing, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? And, you know, we, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're, we're in a spiritual warfare. And we we need to recognize that uh, when he talked, when he said that to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do what you're doing right now. My uh, kingdom so, is so, not of this world. Trial. My kingdom is not of this world. That's that's a fantastic statement. My kingdom is not of this world. But many people say, oh, well, the kingdom does not exist then. But he never said that. He said it's not of this world. Uh, no, he's he's been King Jesus ever since before time. Yeah. On page 96 of your book... You have a quotation from Jesus Christ. And maybe you can read that to us. I mean, do the Jews have the king? Didn't they have the kingdom before? Do they, they, they still have the kingdom? Are they going to have the kingdom again? I mean, what are we talking about when we say Actually, the chapter kingdom? Chapter 21. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 15 about, I am the vine, ye are the branches, but if you don't abide in me, You'll, you'll die as branches and be cast into the fire. And then he tells the parable in Matthew 21, Mark 12, Luke chapter 20 about the vineyard and how that the husbandman sent his son and they killed the son and destroyed him. And, of course, that was Christ who he's talking about. And in Matthew 21, he says in verse 43 and verse 45, he says, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. In verse 45, And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard these, his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. And, and then Peter, in 1 Peter 2, says concerning that nation, be taken from you and given to another nation, Peter said, But ye, believers, Gentiles, whoever, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You know, the Bible is teaching and has taught for over 2,000 years that the chosen generation doesn't have to be a physical generation. It is a spiritual generation, uh, a new birth generation, a born-again generation. And that's the that's the point is that that his seed is spiritual, and they were so focused on a physical lineage to Abraham, a physical seed, and he told them they'll be given to a nation, a different nation, a holy nation. But this is an astonishing statement by Jesus. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits sure. thereof. That's an amazing statement. Right away, he says, "A kingdom of God is taken from you." So they don't, they didn't, yes. they lost it. And where, where, how, how do these dispensationalists say, "Well, they're going to get it back"? <laughs> where, I mean, that's that's incredible because it, it was lost. It was given to somebody else. And Peter defines who he tells us who it was given to. Who given to Christians, and we, yes. we're made into a nation. Yes. You would you would think they would, and there there is a strong passage taken from you and given to another of the replacement theology concept, and I'm not opposed to calling it that. However, I don't believe it so much replacement as it was just a repositioning of what it always has been. In other words, Abraham was a child of God by faith, not by circumcision, mm -hmm. and they that are faith the same are the children of Abraham, and. He's telling this physical group of people that you are you come from a lineage, but you're nothing but a dead branch. You've gotten so far away from the vine, you don't abide in the vine anymore. 
and uh, it's taken from you, and it's it's not what it's not for you. And he, he, in another passage, he said that the outsiders will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the children will be cast out. It's the same thing. You can, you know, no one inherits the kingdom of God by flesh and blood. God does not have grandchildren. Everyone must be his child, must be born again, adopted into his family. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's Peter here, First Peter 2, uh, verses 9 and 10. He's not talking about Jews or Gentiles. He's just talking about people. I mean, you know, he, he's, right. not talking about eth- he's not talking about an ethnic group. But he, everyone who believes in right. Jesus Christ and is saved is, is a member of, of a holy nation. They're a peculiar people. So, so really, right away... We change the meaning, you might say, uh, of a nation, or at least we get a better understanding of what Jesus says is a nation. And that's what's important, because Jews can, uh, and Peter was himself a Jew, physically, but he was a member of a holy nation of Christians, wasn't he? That's right. And the and the, and the proof of that is he said, which in time past were not a people. Mm. So he himself. That, that, that just shows that he's saying. This, in, in other words, they've never been a physical nation, but they but they are a nation now. Well, you know, if you talk about replacement theology, they say you took it from the Jews and gave it to the Gentiles. But what you're talking about in your book, man, and what what God is talking about here, is is taking it from those Jews who did not believe, who did not have the faith of Abraham, and giving it to what that's right whatever people of whatever nation, <laughs> whosoever will that's right. I mean, that's that's who get that that's who becomes right. the nation. That just tells you how fake, that's right. how how much a hoax is all this issue of race, doesn't it? It it make it makes you understand that racism but, is whosoever will. There you go. Racism is silly, and and totally in defiance of God's word. Then it's because it, right <laughs> and and dispensationalism and Schofield, it's very racist, and oh. that's why we have Arabs that are so angry at us because. Sincere but terribly misguided American Christians have thumbed their nose at one ethnic group of people in the Middle East and embraced another ethnic group of people in the Middle East, and it's done nothing but drive a wedge between the message of the gospel for all of those people over there. Mm. Well, you know, it's just, you know, your book, such concepts as genealogy, page 58, you cover it. Uh, Israel and the Church, page 61. See, the seed, you really talk a lot about the seed, uh, Pastor First. I know we just have about two minutes here. The Old Covenant, the kingdom, what it is, the temple, what, what is the temple? We, we didn't even get into all of the current conditions going on, you know, the wars in the Middle East and all those things. And So you, you cover all of these great concepts. Just study these concepts, they would have an understanding, wouldn't they? If we would just get back to the basics and get back to the Bible and away from extra biblical things, which the Bible tells us not to add or to take away from the Word of God. Mm. But I can show on many pages of a Schofield reference Bible where what the notes say at the bottom do not agree with what the Bible says up above. And and I believe there are a lot of sincere guys out there who really think that they're King James only, but the truth is they're Schofield King James only. They're, they're not really following just the King James. They're following the notes of Schofield and the notes that they were taught in their theology class in their seminaries. You know, Pastor, the, when you said earlier in this program that Schofield mentioned that there are three categories of persons. There are the sheep, the goats, and the Jews. That that dug up a, a, a terrible, that was a big pain to my heart because he took away from Jesus' words. Uh, and, and this is, you're right. This, this, these, these terrible uh, lies that people have been taught are taking away the words of God. I want you to have this book, Who is Israel? Who is Israel? By Pastor Matt First. Matt, thank you for being my guest today. My friends, tune in each week during this same time and discover the power of prophecy. Prophecy.